Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army War College, U.S. Army, or Department of Defense. Welcome to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast. I'm Ron Granary, Professor of History at the Department of National Security and Strategy at the U.S. Army War College and podcast editor of The War Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Although its name may suggest otherwise to the uninitiated, the U.S. Army War College is not just for Army officers. Each year, dozens of representatives of the other armed services join the resident and distance classes of the War College, encouraging dialogue between the services and representing the ideal of jointness at the strategic level that we expect students to uphold when they leave Carlisle to take up their future command responsibilities. Athletic and budgetary rivalries notwithstanding, that commitment to jointness even includes naval officers. So what's it like to be a representative of the Navy at the Army War College. How, if at all, do the approaches of the services interact and contrast with each other? Our guest today is Commander Henry Wicks of the War College Class of 2020. Commander Wicks is a U.S. Navy submarine officer with operational experience on both fast attack and ballistic missile submarines. He has deployed to the CENTCOM, UCOM, and SOUTHCOM AORs to include a support tour to the U.S. Army in Afghanistan as part of Operation Enduring Freedom in 2009. Following the Army War College, he will be commencing the Prospective Commanding Officer Pipeline to be Commanding Officer of Fighting Mary, the USS Maryland, SSBN 738, as Commander of the Gold Crew. We're interested in our conversation today about naval strategy and the strategies of naval officers at the U.S. Army War College. Welcome to A Better Peace, Commander Wicks. Thank you, sir. It's uh, good to be here. Yeah. So I want to ask you just generally, what are your impressions of being a student at the War College? Uh, actually, it's been a, a very rewarding experience. Um, I know when I first came here, uh, when I was coming here from uh, the previous Navy tour I was at, they were saying I'd get a lot of grief and that uh, things would be very different. Um, and we do get a little bit of grief whenever uh, Army and Navy <laughs> are playing anybody in any kind of sports event. Uh, and some good nature. It's a good thing they didn't play things. this past year, right? I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and some good natured ribbing, but um, actually it's been interesting because I've actually seen less differences than maybe some of the other Naval officers uh, had said I would see. And mm. part of that was maybe just uh, having worked with the army previously, but in a lot of respects, um, the way the U S military approaches things kind of cuts across services. Now we do have, some of our own service specific uh, impressions, but a lot of it I found actually, it seemed very similar to what I had worked with in the Navy. The idea is about taking care of your soldiers or in my case, sailors uh, and working on the mission uh, seemed to cut across service lines. And uh, uh, for, for those who don't, those who are not themselves former students at, uh, at PME, um, how much input did you have in selecting uh, the Army War College as your senior service college? So I was actually able to uh, have, it sounds like a, a little more input than some of the other services do. Uh, mm -hmm. The Navy's approach to professional military education uh, is a little bit different um, for the Army and the Air Force. This is a kind of a required stepping stone. You must uh, hit this at a certain point in your career uh, in order to uh, move on to a next uh, specific milestone. For mm -hmm. the Navy, it's a little different. Um, we still require it before you go on to uh, the 06 commands. Um, but we try to fit it in at, um, about this time in our career, but as it kind of works with just our sea and shore rotation, uh, cause sometimes you'll get extended on the ship or in the aircraft squadron that you're in. And so you may not hit a specific year milestone, but you'll, uh, get it, uh, somewhere in this time before you move on to the more, uh, senior levels. Right. And, and so when you, when you arrived this past summer, uh, did you, uh, did you already have an idea what your next command was going to be? Or did, did you just discover that your, your command, uh, your assignment to the Maryland, um, over the course of this year? 
I actually uh, discovered my assignment to the Maryland over the course of this year, but I was uh, pretty sure that I was either going to be um, pretty quickly put into the prospective command officer pipeline following the War College, or mm. depending on the needs of the Navy, they might uh, move me to a uh, staff job that they needed my War College basically credentials and the PME experience I got here to be able to fill that job before I moved on to prospective commanding officer. Mm-hmm. So, so you, but you came, you came out of the water to come to Carlisle and you're going back in the water, um, after you leave, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so it's actually been kind of nice to be at Carlisle because for the first time in many years, uh, I actually, uh, have a chance to see mountains. Don't tend to be a lot of <laughs> mountains right next to the ocean where the Navy has submarine bases. So <laughs> truth. Okay. Well, um, to think about this, then we, we, the, uh, the war college talks about how our, the, the purpose of, of professional military education at this level is to encourage tactically successful officers to develop the strategic perspective to become strategic leaders. And so I am, uh, how do you see, or do you see differences in strategic outlook between say the, the naval ideas that you've been, uh, that you brought with you to the war college and what you've been able to discover about other services approaches to strategy. I do see some differences, uh, the naval approach to it. Um, and it's actually mostly contrasted between the army approach, uh, for the Navy, we never really hold a piece of the ocean. It's not mm-hmm. something that we are brought up as you will, you know, take this portion of the ocean and hold it, uh, and defend it, um, any of those kind of things. So our perspective is it's always a matter of what level of sea control can you kind of have? Do you have very transitory sea control or do you have sea control that's sufficient that you can really, um, do whatever you want right there? Or is it just enough that you can move through quickly on your way to somewhere else? Um, looking at the army and how they discussed, um, different problems and discussed kind of their strategies, they definitely have to think about the, okay, you have taken some ground. Now, what are you doing with that ground? What are you doing with the people who live there? How are you helping them? Is that the ground you wanted to take? Those kind of things. So that was a different perspective uh, for sure. And it's interesting to think as well, um, talking with the army about that, you can't just sail away when you're done doing whatever you're doing. You've taken something and now you have to uh, try to make it better than when you started. So it makes you have to think about what are the second and the third and the fourth order effects of what you just did Um, Mm -hmm. in the Navy. For example, if I drop a depth charge in the water, other than maybe some fish and hopefully if they're trying to get a submarine, a submarine, there's not a whole lot of other consequences. I keep moving on, but Mm -hmm. for the army, you have to think about, well, what did you do with that ground now that you took it? So I thought that was an interesting change of perspective. That is an interesting and, and I, we we talked about this a little bit uh, before the program, and in uh, and I'm curious about this. Uh, you mentioned that you see that there are similarities, more similarities between dealing with sea power and dealing with air power in the same way that we're talking about spaces that you can't you can't grab and hold, but you can try to control access to. Uh, yes, sir. So um, for air power, it's the same thing. It's a transitory level of control. So. Uh, what I tried to kind of bring my perspective when I was talking with my seminar and then in taking the Army's perspective as well so we could kind of share some knowledge there was for both air power from sea power, you basically need a certain level of control of that domain long enough to do some given thing. But whatever that given thing is you're trying to do may not be very long term. It may be pretty short uh, term. But then if you are taking ground, you you have that ground, you now are thinking about how to hold that long term. And uh, moving forward, um, I talked to a lot of the army officers about a new concept they had uh, been developing over the last few years, uh, multi-domain operations, and thinking about um, large-scale ground combat now is kind of the thing they're refocusing on after uh, about two decades of counterinsurgency. And one of the things they're thinking about is a multi-domain operation, how to synchronize across all the domains. And that's something that is a very interesting concept to me uh, because it requires um, you to really think about, okay, some of these domains, such as land, I'm going to be there persistently for an extended period of time. Other domains, such as air or the sea, I'm only going to be there and I only need to be there in sufficient strength to do whatever it is I want to do right now. And then I need to recover my forces from that because they can't stay in that domain indefinitely. I need them to move to a different place. So Mm -hmm. I see a lot of similarities there. And um, I tried whenever we were discussing inside of our seminar with the various army officers to kind of give some of that perspective about it's a transitory level of control you have. At some point, you have to 
go back to base to refuel or resupply. You're not going to just hold that piece of water forever or piece right. of air forever. So make sure that you time it and synchronize it so that when everything shows up, it's when you want it to show up and it's for the right effect. Well, and, and thinking about that, uh, the comparative element, uh, the, the issue of, of keeping and holding is one thing. I'm also thinking about the, the, the realities of command that, uh, if you command a ship, you might have a similar number of men under your command, a number of, of sailors under your command that a, uh, a comparable army officer would have. But the difference is, is when you're on the ship, you are cut off from everybody else. Um, so if you're commanding a, if you're commanding a, a, a battalion, um, that battalion might actually have some kind of contact with other battalions. Whereas, but if you're commanding a, a good sized ship with a similar number of sailors, um, you are a little more cut off. Do you think that makes the command responsibilities of a naval officer on a ship uh, fundamentally different from the command experiences, the command responsibilities of a of an army unit? I think it does uh, make some differences. Um, one of the biggest ones I can think of is you have to first take care of the ship before you can do any other mission. So the ship's not just there to provide an effect for the joint force or the Navy. It's also the home and the kitchen and the repair and resupply. It's pretty much everything right there. So you have to make sure that the ship is okay before you can move on to higher level missions and things like that. And I know talking with some of my uh, army officer colleagues, like they have other um, units that are kind of integrated to support them. And those units are very directly tied in in terms of, hey, the um, resupply is coming at this time or this is who's in charge of protecting the base while you go out and do this. Uh, when you're on a ship, all of that's kind of self-contained. Um, now, for a surface ship that's conventionally powered, you do still have to get resupplied with oil and things like that um, to keep steaming out at sea. But the first thing you have to do in terms of command responsibility is make sure, hey, have I taken care of all the things I need to do just to get the ship to the right place and make sure the people are fed, um, watered. You know, we, we've actually had a chance to get sleep all that ahead of time. Uh, and then once you finally get there, then you can finally start to do things to, um, affect the area outside of your, um, own small little ship. Uh, mm -hmm. so I think that's a big difference in that command responsibility is you got to kind of take care of the ship first before you can move on to <laughs> executing any mission for anybody else. And have you, um, have, have all of your experiences, uh, been, uh, with submarines since you've been in the Navy? Uh, they have not actually. Uh, so I did a tour, um, we call it kind of a disassociated tour. I did a tour, um, with Comfibron 4. So I was on some amphibious assault ships. Um, mm -hmm. we deployed with a, uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit. Uh, so I got to see kind of the resupply side of that being tasked, uh, with, uh, doing operations for somebody else in that deployment. Uh, was to both UCOM and then CENTCOM and then was in the opening days of uh, Operation Odyssey Dawn. So saw a lot there about interacting um, and again, kind of that delivering effects at a certain time and place uh, and then how that worked with the higher headquarters. And then at the lower level um, for us individually going, okay, we have to make sure we get you know resupplied at this time so we can support the uh, mission that we're doing later on tonight uh, for a higher headquarters like AFRICOM or somebody like that. Uh, and then separate from that, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction, I also did a, uh, tour, um, as part of a, um, embedded training team, uh, in Afghanistan in 2009, uh, which was a very interesting experience because I'm a submarine officer. So what do I know about teaching the Afghan army? Uh, but it turned out that, um, a lot of things in this instance, I was, uh, kind of tasked with teaching them kind of base maintenance and things of that nature. So a lot of it came down to just basic things that we in the U.S. military almost kind of take for granted in terms of sustaining your base functions, in terms of, you know, make sure the lights stay on from an electrical standpoint. You have clean water, you have sanitation set up, those kind of things. That's the kind of stuff that I was able to kind of help train the Afghan army on um, that was just kind of common across the services, like all the services in the U.S. military. You know, think about, hey, you got to make sure the bases are supportable, those kind of things. So those have been some interesting and varied experiences. And then obviously there's the submarine side of it. So. Right. And so when you were when you had the position in Afghanistan, how long were you? I'm, I'm guessing you were uh, uh, you, know, you were far from the water in Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> how, how long were you there? <laughs> Uh, I was there for about uh, nine months total, um, oh. and it was in uh, Jalalabad, Afghanistan, just outside there at a uh, small Ford operating base called Fob Huey. Um, mm -hmm. And it was 
supposed to be a much longer tour, supposed to go about 12 to 13 months. Uh, but this was in 2009 and right towards the end of that time, um, what had been happening was uh, the Air Force and the Navy had been sending people who weren't necessarily normally involved in kind of ground combat type operations. So not CBs or not combat controllers or people like that. Um, and we've been sending them as part of uh, support to the army because the army was obviously very busy uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. So things where we could provide assistance like, hey, we can teach them how to maintain bases and things like mm -hmm. that. Um, we'd been uh, tasked with those missions, but right towards the end of 2009, um, the army had started to kind of regress a little bit out of Afghanistan or uh, out of Iraq. Um, they had more forces available to move into Afghanistan. And so they uh, were able to take over some of those missions. It would have normally been more of a traditional army mission and uh, they're able to retrograde um, the Navy and the air force officers back. So at that point, the Navy was like, okay, well, you're actually a submariner, so we're sure you like the mountains in Afghanistan, but we actually need you to uh, get back onto the water so we can get our money's <laughs> worth from you. <laughs> That's very good, right? They've, they've, it's, it's good when they make you do the things they trained you to do. Um, yes. Well, one of the things, and, and I guess uh, full disclosure, I should have mentioned that you were a student or our student this year in Seminar 20, which is the seminar at the War College where I am the uh, National Security and Strategy faculty member. So I was there for this discussion. When we talked about nuclear strategy in the seminar, one of the uh, interesting uh, it's not a tension, but one of the interesting, let's say, uh, differences between the services is that while the army has relatively little uh, to do with nuclear strategy compared to the Air Force and especially, and the Navy. And so I am curious, when you bring in discussions of nuclear strategy, especially as someone who's going to go and potentially command a uh, ballistic missile submarine, is how does the Navy integrate the study of nuclear weapons, nuclear strategy, into its larger training for officers? So for the Navy, one of the big things uh, we talk about is we hold about 70% of the accountable uh, nuclear warheads. Um, so that's under the New START Treaty. About 70% of those warheads that are deployable um, end up on uh, Navy vessels, and it just mm. happens to be, which are all the ballistic missile submarines. Uh, and it just happens to be that's just the way the U.S. Uh, nuclear triad is structured. Um, there's the ballistic missile submarines, there's uh, the ground-based uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and then the ground-based bombers, uh, and those two are held by the Air Force, and then we have the submarines. Um, so it's interesting, the Navy, we spend a lot of time thinking about that because those ballistic missile submarines are one part of the nation's number one uh, for the Department of Defense, one of the number one missions of protecting the nation mm -hmm. and that strategic uh, nuclear deterrence. So we spend a lot of time in the Navy in general just talking about we have to make sure that stays funded. Um, we have to make sure that, you know, we understand why that is important. We don't forget that. And that includes even the surface warfare and the air um, officers in the Navy that they understand, like, you know, it's not as maybe glamorous as flying off an aircraft carrier or driving destroyers or cruisers, but that's an important mission that we have to make sure we fund. Um, so right off the bat, that happens. And then I know, having talked to some other officers who are in the Pentagon, where that also comes up for the Navy, especially, and it's a tension that we always are kind of dealing with as a service is when you're doing any kind of recapitalization of that uh, nuclear triad. So right now there's been some uh, discussion, I know in the news, there's been uh, lots of uh, discussion up on Capitol Hill over the last couple of years about we're having to recapitalize um, a lot of the assets that are associated with our nuclear triad, and it's very expensive uh, and in the Navy's case, um, the oncoming uh, new ballistic missile submarine will be the Columbia class, and we need it um, because the Ohio class, like the USS Maryland that I'm going towards, um, they're getting pretty old. Um, and so we need to make sure they can still do the mission, but we just need to make sure you can't run them forever. Uh, so you have to buy that follow on um, class. And it's pretty expensive because if you're assuming that the life of that ship is going to be 50 plus years, potentially. You don't want to buy something that works out perfect for you today, but is not really able to meet that number one mission uh, 15 or 20 years from now. So we're running into that tension just from a budgeting perspective and from thinking about how to pay for different things, um, which is interesting because we talk a lot at the higher level strategic of um, that tension between acquisition and what do you want to buy versus what do you need to do today. Um, in the Navy, we've been having to really try to figure out how we're going to buy the balanced fleet that we need to execute that sea control um, overseas. 
but also still be able to pay for this ballistic missile submarine that we have to buy. It's the number one mission, but it's pretty expensive if we expect it to have to last for 50 years. So right. that's kind of the, I guess, long answer to your question of well, sorry, how it's, it's, it kind it's... of always just shows up in the Navy. Right. Well, it's a good question. And of course, for the Navy, right, two of the Navy's uh, most visible, let's say, platforms, right? One is the ballistic missile submarine and the other is the aircraft carrier, right? They are, they are expensive, big ticket items. The aircraft carrier has come in for a lot of, uh, so let's say, reconsideration lately as people think about what does it mean when, uh, when an aircraft carrier is vulnerable to um, uh, anti, anti-area uh, or anti-access and area denial strategies like uh, cruise missiles and other uh, uh, surface to surface to surface missiles that can uh, neutralize the power of an aircraft carrier um, that is otherwise very expensive. Does the Navy have a sense of how they imagine the role of an aircraft carrier in force projection uh, in the years to come, especially in, when I think about regions like the South China Sea, which people talk about where uh, it's important to be there, but it's going to be increasingly difficult to get there. So, um, I know there's been lots of discussion in, uh, open press about that. I'm sure we've run many classified war games on what we're going to do with it. <laughs> Which we won't um, discuss here just, on a better piece. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just talking to what I've seen, um, in the media, what I've seen in, um, opinion editorials, what I've seen in, uh, various like RAND studies or other think tank studies, um, the aircraft carrier still can fill a role, um, for the U S Navy in the years ahead it may not look exactly like it did now or it did in the late 20th century, but it still gives you um, a pretty vital capability because it gives you flexibility of um, basing, especially of aircraft. So just the ability to reconfigure the armament on the aircraft and the ability to... So what that means is you can shift from um, doing some kind of a mission where you're doing air defense with the aircraft on the aircraft carrier to you can shift them to a strike mission, which you can use to do um, close air support, or you can do, you know, potentially strategic strike type things uh, to you can use them to help you with sea control in terms of escorting uh, ships or enforcing a blockade or something like that. So that flexibility of having a airfield basically that you can move anywhere in the world and you don't necessarily have to ask permission or spend years building up uh, diplomatic credentials with a host nation to be able to get your forces there has a pretty powerful effect uh, for the U.S. military and the U.S. in general for our national security strategy, where I've seen a lot of the um, discussion in that open source has been more in terms of what is the carrier air wing of the 21st century going to look mm. like? And um, I'm not a naval aviator, but I know they have uh, started uh, moving forward with unmanned uh, aircraft for the refueling mission, which is pretty important because you don't want to run out of gas over the middle of the ocean because bailing <laughs> out uh, doesn't work out so well there. Right. Um, and they've started to move ahead with that. And I've seen a lot of interesting discussion about potentially um, using more unmanned aircraft to extend the range of the air wing and those kind of things and kind of, there's always in naval warfare and really in all warfare kind of a balance between the offense and the defense. Right now, it maybe looks like the defense from the land has a little bit of an advantage against the offense from the aircraft carrier, but potentially shifting to uh, some unmanned aircraft to kind of extend your range and get you a little bit further out so the defense can't hit you and you can still project power in. Uh, looks like a way that we might be going uh, with aircraft carriers into the 21st and maybe beyond centuries. But I think there's definitely a recognition in the Navy uh, overall that some changes have to be made in terms of just how we, because aircraft carriers are expensive, how we think about, um, how they're composited on that air wing and what the aircraft carrier will be used for, uh, so that we don't get too reliant on one particular path that can then be negated with something much cheaper. Right. Uh, and, and that is always the, the as you say, right, that uh, sometimes defense can, when defense gets the, the upper hand over, over force projection, defense can be cheaper. Uh, at least until until a better form of offense comes up with. Um, one of the other issues that I wanted to talk to you about about thinking about strate- strategy, thinking about uh, about weaponry, is also think about the nature of command uh, in the Navy and in the in the Army. We talk a lot at the War College. We talk about mission command. We talk about the uh, the initiative of the commander and the, the need for creativity. Um, and, and even when we think um, at the higher levels of strategy, um, in what ways does the Navy approach the question of mission command and the role of the commander in, uh, in reaching the larger strategic goals of the enterprise? 
So uh, it's very interesting um, to me, the concept of mission command, because uh, to myself as a Navy officer, or uh, if you talk to a Marine Corps officer, um, another one, kind of the Naval uh, services, uh, if you talk to us, a lot of the things um, that have been recently published for the Army, especially because they've kind of made a pivot back to what they say is mission command to to us, we would look at that when we say, isn't that just kind of all you're, always how you're supposed to lead? Isn't that good leadership? But I think it's because of just our historical background as sea services. We're used to, once you go over the horizon, you can't really talk to anybody <laughs> back home for help. So right. one, whoever sent you over the horizon has to trust that you are trained, you are proficient, and that you have their intent for what you want to do uh, or for what they want you to do. Um, and then conversely, with the people going over the horizon, you have to be very clear before you leave, hey, what is the commander's intent? Or at the strategic level, what is it that the civilian leadership wants me to do? What What are they trying to get at? And they may not tell me a specific about how they want that solved, but they trust that I am understanding of their intent that I know where they want me to go and what they want me to do and that I'll go out and do it. Um, and so it's interesting to me that the army has been having this, um, kind of discussion in their doctrine, uh, really over the last about three or well, more than that. But what I've seen, uh, especially coming up in, um, discussions in class was over the last three or four years, kind of having that discussion about mission command. Um, and they, they've talked about it a lot. And I think, Part of it um, that has been interesting in terms of that discussion is also that at one point in the doctrine, I was reading an interesting article by General Townsend about this. It was a military review. Um, at one point, their doctrine, they got rid of the term command and control completely, and they just hmm. used mission command. And so that caused some confusion because uh, that meant that both the philosophy, the doctrine, and then you know everything you did to actually execute command and control over your soldiers was all lumped up underneath mission command when mission command is really more of kind of a command philosophy. There's mm -hmm. there's different ways you can do it. You can do very centralized command. You can do a mission command um, type template, or you can do something kind of a mix in between. So it's been interesting to see that. Um, but the other interesting part of that that I'll say is for the army officers, like they, they've had a lot of um, discussion about the doctrine and what does mission command mean and those kind of things. But mm -hmm. with their experiences in doing counterinsurgency over the last two decades, every army officer I talked to kind of inherently knows what they would like to do. And what they would like to do is kind of that mission command of, you know, I can't get a guidance from the four star general to tell me exactly what I needed to do when I was a captain deployed in Iraq or Afghanistan. But I knew in general what they wanted overall the country to look like. They wanted it to be safer. They wanted it to be better for the people living there, those kind of things. And so they kind of just took up that, okay, well, that's the overall intent. So let me do what I can to get it. So I think it's something that services all understand is just sometimes when we put it into doctrine and we try to codify it, it gets a little more tricky because then we start kind of arguing over wording as opposed to thinking about, well, you know, isn't that already how we kind of operate? Right. And the idea is, is that you should be trained well enough in your, in your mission so that you know what is, what is expected of you when it's all over. Um, and I guess that's, uh, for somebody who's going to take command of a ballistic missile submarine that is designed to be out of contact, but to know exactly what its mission is supposed to be. Um, that's a particularly important aspect of, of command is that sense of, it's not, uh, it's not independence because you know what your mission is, but it is you're going to be expected to operate according to what you've been trained to do without without somebody there to hold your hand. Yes, sir. That's uh, very correct. They um, they talk a lot for uh, that um, for us, especially in the Navy is, you know, hey, you need to know what it is that um, the commander, maybe one, two, three, potentially four levels up, wants to know or wants you to be doing and then just use your best judgment to do that. Um, and then with that, make sure you instill that into your subordinates as well, because eventually you should be training your relief. Uh, so give them the leeway, give them the overall guidance, but don't tell them exactly how to do it. Um, for that command and control uh, side of the, uh, like the strategic deterrence where I'm getting ready to go, um, it's very much the commander's intent is very much, you know, you, you have to see the specifics uh, telling you, yep, it's time to go. Otherwise, your, go your job is just to be out there and maintain the deterrence and don't let anybody know you're there unless the boss wants you to know that uh, for a specific reason. Right. 
Well, and since if, if it's about communication, it's about preparing people for strategy. We're delighted that you came to the U.S. Army War College to uh, to communicate the rest of us about the experiences of being a naval officer and uh, how to how to be a part of the the strategic force going forward. Um, Henry Wicks, I'm afraid we are just about out of time for today, but I really do appreciate you joining us on a better piece. So thanks for being here. Thank you, sir. And thanks to all of you for listening in. Please send us your comments on this program and all the programs and send us suggestions for future programs. Also, please rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcast so that other people can find it as well. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you and we hope to see you again here on A Better Peace. But until next time, from the War Room, I'm Ron Greenery. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.